podcast right. and I do a bunch of things and I rant. And one of the things that I rant about and I speak about in my work, this is something that's of particular interest to me and something that I think didn't get the attention it deserved as are so many cases of issues of marginalized people in sports. So this is one of the cases that I'm very, very happy and grateful that Dr. Sita thought it was worth sharing with you and knowing a little bit about. Um, so intersectional justice and the right to cheer, Iranian women, soccer, and state politics. I will interchangeably use football and soccer, both are completely fine. I don't, I'm not going to die on a hill that one is better than the other. So um, there's other hills to die on. So I'll just, I'll start. Um, and if at any point you want to stop me and ask a question, I don't know what your rules are for your classroom. Right. Please go ahead. I can always pause. I got a little carried away with the Prezi. Um, there's like 30 <laughs> slides, and I will speed through some of them. Um, but I also love imagery because it's very potent. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. So let's start now. I think it's like started already. Okay, so... I really like this image and I just inserted it because my friend Ben Hong actually did it to go alongside a piece that I wrote for a site called Unusual Efforts. And it's just very symbolic of, you know, what happens, exclusion. Much of the story is about exclusion, it's about misogyny, it's about patriarchy. It's a photo of women attending in 1977 and the ban came two years later of the revolution. Now, you're thinking, wait a minute. It on, why do they have a band? They have a kick-ass futsal women's team that just won the AFC futsal championship. I know that's what you're all thinking. <laughs> <laughs> because that is actually true. So how is it that women can be fostered, have a women's sport ministry, one of the only countries in the Middle East that actually have a sports cabinet that's dedicated to women participating, but not be allowed in stadiums? That makes no sense. Precisely. Makes no sense whatsoever. And yeah, if you look for GIFs on this, on Twitter, you'll, you'll find them because they're so fantastic and they're GIF worthy of their playing. So this is a friend of mine, Sada, who runs Open Stadiums. She's actually one of the main, she and this organization are some of the main campaigners. Her name is not Sada, it's an alias because the work she does could literally lend her to be jailed and detained, which has happened before. She has never been held in Elven Prison, which is a famous prison in Tehran, but she was detained by authorities for trying to get into the stadium. Um, and she was born much after the revolution began, but her entire life and many women, many generations of women actually, two generations at least of women, have never known the liberty, the freedom, and the excitement of attending any sporting event in their own country. And we, I think when people think about that, they're like, on the list of horrors that women have to endure in different places, is this really important? Yes, it actually is. We're not, it's not the oppression Olympics that this issue is more important than another issue. Another issue. We're talking about sport, we're talking about inclusion, and we're talking about big federations that are actually complicit in this injustice. So, although the ban was enacted in 1979, 1981, October 5th, the Iranian Derby, the Tehran Derby, which is actually two teams from Tehran, a derby for those that don't know, and the soccer world are when two teams from the same city play each other. So you might have heard of the North London Derby or you might have heard of the you know, Madrid Derby. Just for example, it's just a, a term for two teams from the same place playing each other. And there's like really ridiculous amounts of fandom behind them. So Esfagal is in one and Persepolis is the other one in, in Tehran. So this was the last time that women were permitted to watch the derby was in 1981. And until now, well, until then, they were banned. And this was uh, February of 2017 that Sada tweeted this. Okay, so I don't know if this is working. Is this working? No. But I'm going to um, let you folks see a really cool trailer for a movie by Jafar Kanai, who's a really amazing <laughs> filmmaker from Iran. And he wrote a script and created a movie based on this entire issue, because his own child attempted to get into a stadium dressed as a man. So, just have a look at this.
I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix, so if anyone wants to have a look at it, I think it's a really, really, really well done movie. And it would be something, I believe, worthwhile to take a look at. Just a little bit of backward information again on the actual band. Um, I'm going to use the word nonsensical quite often, probably in this presentation. One of the things that you should know about the stadium band is it doesn't only apply to football. So FIFA, which is a governing body of football, wouldn't be the only complicit federation. It applies to volleyball. It applies to any stadium and any sport. So women can't access it, and even it applies to public squares. So anywhere in the country, um, women are not permitted by law to be able to attend. Now, the interesting thing about this, and when I say interesting, I mean nonsensical, is that women from other countries can come and attend. So if Iran is playing in <laughs> Japan, as we saw, and Japanese fans come, they are permitted. I have no other explanation for that other than it makes no sense. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions like, well, why does this even happen? But before we go, I'll get to the why. So access to stadiums is necessary and crucial. Access to sport is a birthright, right. And one that AFC, the AFC, which is the Asian Football Confederation, and other federations need to push the Iranian authorities for, not only for spectators, but also for further journalists, for media personnel, coaches, medical staff, et cetera, because football is for us. <laughs> now, the thing is, is that when we see a movie like Offside or we hear about access, we think about spectators generally. But we're also not realizing that it cuts off career opportunities for women. It cuts off career opportunities in media. It cuts it off for photojournalists. It, cut it cuts it off for physiotherapists, for medical folks, for coaching, for administrations. They simply can't go. And when you think about the amount of jobs that are possibly kept from women just based on gender, this actually is vehemently opposed to FIFA's own charter. And all of these major federations of sports, it's against their own constitutions, not to discriminate on basis of gender, sexual identity, etc. So this is completely diametrically opposed to what they're supposed to advocate for, which is the sport and the athletes and the community. So this is a really, this is a, a woman named Parisa Portanahin, and she is a photojournalist. She's not allowed into the stadium, so she had to set herself up couple of kilometers away in order to take photos of the match. This is how far she was with that lens, you can imagine. And a friend of mine, Maria Majid, is actually applied to the AFC for a media pass to be able to access a derby, which will be happening today, which is probably happening right now, and she was denied. And this wasn't from Iranian authorities, it was from the actual federation, the Asian Football Confederation, so it makes you wonder who's making the rules and who's advocating for whom and who's really supporting the injustice. Okay, so we get to why. Why is, why is this rule? Why does it happen? And you're probably thinking, why is this happening in Iran when places, even as recently as last spring, Saudi Arabia started to allow, pre-World Cup started to allow women into their states. <laughs> why is this happening? This doesn't happen in many Muslim-majority countries like Turkey, like Indonesia, like Malaysia. This doesn't happen all over the Muslim world. Why is it only it on? It must be based on some Sharia law. Actually, no, it's not. It's really not. Because if it was strict in Sharia law, don't you think other Muslim majority countries would also adopt the same thing? I mean, I'm sorry, but in a lot of places, if men have an opportunity to bar women from something, they're going to do it. But they, it hasn't happened necessarily. It on is very specific to this. Um, one of the issues that gets flown around is that safety. Safety for women because arenas and stadiums are full of people, so it's unsafe. So instead of, I don't know, making sure that those areas are safe, it's just easier to bar women from going because that makes a lot of sense. Next, protection of women. Protection of women against vulgarity in terms of language, in terms of things being thrown out because, you know, women are totally incapable of handling themselves in public situations. You know, it's not like we foster birth in humankind or anything. It's really difficult for us to get profanity. 
It's very difficult. <laughs> um, societal norms. Well, you know, you could argue that women just don't love football. Wrong. No, actually, getting back to the fact that women have been involved in Iranian society and sport for an extremely long time. It's not true. Um, and basically, it's always going to come back to the last reason, just because men. Just because men. Like, I'm not even joking about this. Men like to make up rules. Men can like to make up rules about women that affect women without consulting women on the rules that they're going to implement that will affect women. That's pretty much across the board. Now, I'm not blaming men. No, I'm totally blaming men. <laughs> men I'm, calling, I'm calling out their privilege. I'm calling out the unnecessary use of using religious law and interpretations and patriarchal interpretations of that law to ban women from something that's simply just not necessary. Now, one of the specific reasons that people have argued is that, um, people can argue, is that it's sinful for women to watch men play because their shorts will light up in between the navel to the knee. It's considered private, but instead <laughs> it's considered um, not appropriate. But it would be not appropriate for everybody. It's not like, oh, that's specifically not okay for women to watch. Would, if you're going to use that rule, use the rule holistically and say that nobody should be able to see it. It's considered that in terms of your personal area, nobody should be able to see it. And I don't know, there's this thing called compression tights that could be used. So instead of getting men to alter their uniforms, like women alter their uniforms, there's three countries in the world where women must, by their country's own dictation, wear a headscarf. One of them is Iran, one of them is Saudi Arabia, one of them is Oman. Those are the three countries for absolutely in stone if women want to represent those countries abroad, Asian Games, Olympics, Pan, whatever, Pan Am Games, they must, not Pan Am Games, what am I talking about? What am I talking about? Um, <laughs> they must um, cover. So covering for the sake of having to cover is not something that's foreign to these nations. I don't know, maybe get men to wear pants. I play football in pants and I'm just fine. I'm old, but that's a different story. <laughs> like, they could. But it's much easier just to ban women than to come up with a practical solution. So this is what we see happening. Again, because men. So let's talk about the resistance. What happened? Now, as long as there have been bans in place that exclude women, there have been movements are led by women in marginalized communities. There's no doubt about this. Many, many of them. So this is no exception. This issue is no exception. Now, underground, grassroots level, before social media really started to get forward, where there were movements, there were magazine articles, underground papers, reformist papers in Iran that were talking about this issue. Because all of a sudden, you had a population that used to attend in droves and was suddenly not allowed. So how does that happen overnight? something that you love doing and love participating in, something you might identify with. And the very interesting thing about this is that this Ministry of Sport really started to fund women, women as well post-revolution. So again, it's nonsensical. They start investing in development of women's sport, but don't have them allowed, they're not allowed to go see their own team and share for their country people. It's very bizarre. So an organization called White Scarves was born 2005. Now, White Scrubs was literally because half of the stadium, initially what was requested was of male spectators to take White Scrubs as a sign of solidarity for the women that could no longer attend. So it was them being half of the population is not allowed to go. So they named themselves White Scrubs. In, in, in Persian, it's White Scrubs. But they changed the name to be more um, inclusive. It's called open stadiums now. How come this is not working? One of my YouTube things were working. Just give me one second. There we go.
know, Human Rights Watch and human rights organizations in Iran are so proactive in how they are, how they are talking about this issue. And one of the things to keep in mind is that when you learn about something, the best way to learn about it is actually not to read Nick Kristoff, but it's actually to listen to grassroots organizers in that country. Like, what is not helpful for organizations like this is to have this white saviorist complex of people come and fly in and say, this is what we need to do for you. Iranian women don't need saving. They need support and amplification of their voices. And this is key to this issue. Yeah, it's absolutely okay to sign a change.org <coughs> petition. Their change.org petition has 60,000 signatures at this point. Um, one going to FIFA, one going to FIUB. But the point is, where you get your information is also really, really important. Now, most of the time, human rights organizations, I mean, yes, there's rife with politics, because every organization is, but it's really important to make sure that you're getting that information from independent sources or either legitimate sources, which is why I say you want your news or interest in this. Go to open stadiums. That's literally the horse's mouth. It's literally a horse. You're not calling you a horse, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, part of the resistance. How do you get into stadiums? Because it's not as if women never have. Because as men, great as men are at creating rules, women are brilliant and ingenious in the way they can circumvent and try to push back. So, they dress up as men. This is dangerous. This is dangerous for many reasons because they can be detained. If they find out they're violating the law, they can be charged, they could potentially go on their files, and they could be put in prison. Now, because of the media attention to this, they're very reluctant to do it, whereas women were jailed before. Maria Majid, who was a photojournalist I mentioned, was jailed in 2011 for trying to get into a stadium. Now, Iranian authorities are very, very reluctant to do that now because of the media around this issue, because it's Tweet Twitter because of Instagram, because of Snapchat, because people are literally live showing what's happening. And when you have a banner of FIFA all over the place, and then you have women <coughs> being detained for one to attend, it doesn't look good for FIFA, who we know are a cesspool of corruption. But, you know, this makes them look even worse, if that's actually possible. So, a little bit of the significant events. I just think it's really interesting to build up and bring us to where we are now. After a World Cup qualifying match in 98, I'm going to ask this. How many of you were born in 98? Oh, my God. Okay. Um, okay, wait a minute. How many of you saw Zidane win the Cup in 96 then? Oh. Oh, thank God for you two. I just don't know how long that was. Oh, my goodness. Um, after a World Cup qualifying match, women greeted Team Ali. Team Iran is known as Team Ali. It's their nickname. And security was so overwhelmed by this. So this wasn't, we, the women were just wanting to, they didn't play in Azadi. They just had come back and there was like a reception, you know, when someone wins the Stanley Cup. Hasn't happened in Canada for a while, but there's a big parade. So this was similar. Women just wanted to attend the celebration. Security was so overwhelmed because they had just assumed that there was a law and as unjust as it was, it would just be obeyed. But no, women are much more resilient than that. They went to go meet. So they did, oh, I misspelled women. Anyways, they entered Azadi, but they were quickly escorted out. Like that lasted maybe a whole hour. Um, and in 2004, this is ongoing. Very little press, open stadiums, takes to start writing letters to FIFA that go unanswered. FIVB, FIVBA. Because this entire time, there are tournaments, major international tournaments, being held in Iran. Because despite what people think, this infrastructure in that country for sports is incredible. So it's an, fairly inexpensive. You fly your team in, and you, and it's very, very safe of a country to be in. Um, you go, you attend, you hold your events there, and then you fly out. But all these international federations were doing this under the radar because they didn't want anyone to know and realize that they were doing something that was just going alongside with this blatant exclusion and injustice. So in 2004, again, a qualifying match, journalists attempted to enter Azadi for in the Iran-Germany match, 
that they were badly beaten. Some were badly beaten to the point where there was hospitalization required. And that's, if you look on Radio International, one of the first articles that came out in mainstream media about this issue. It's because when media gets attacked, the rest of the media pays attention. And human rights organizations also got involved, journalists without borders got involved, and were like, wait a minute, they should have access to report without being beaten. So there's many different sort of segments and many different arteries running through this issue. It's exclusion of media, lack of information, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the first articles that you can find about it. Um, so 2005, as I mentioned, White Scarves begins, <coughs> excuse me, their online campaign to fight for access to stadiums. And the reason it was 2005, because social media. Now we all know social media is exhausting, and I hate to Mark Zuckerberg as much as everybody else, but I rely on for important things like reminders for Shereen and Courtney Day. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's benefit as much as we like to say, well, this is terrible, and you know, you know, Jack on Twitter does nothing for online abuse, etc. Absolutely, but there are benefits to this. Grassroots movements grow. I mean, I think you all must have heard about how the Arab Spring was projected through social media how resistance voices grew through that way. People who didn't have amplification now have an opportunity to share their own opinions and thoughts. And this, is, can, be a, this can be and is a very powerful thing, particularly in places like Iran. 2005 again. This is really interesting because the movie Offside was reflected on this, on this film. Iran and Bahrain match, this massive protest outside by women. So security forces relent. In the, in the offside movie was based on reality. I mean, it's a fictional story, but it's based very much, much on the truth. What actually happened though, is at the end, security forces relented because a call came from the president's office because it was election time and said, let them in just for this once. But there was so much chaos and it was so much so that the security forces didn't even know how to handle taking a ticket from a woman because the woman wouldn't issue tickets or get scalped to tickets, which is again, not allowed. So it was just this massive gong show. But essentially, some women were permitted in, but then, you know, I think they didn't actually get in for the second half of the second half. So fast forward, way fast forward. And this is where we're going to be. So 2018, Gianni Infantino. So before we get to Gianni Infantino, I'm not going to skip over Seth Ladder because it's worth to mention that when he was asked about this issue by press, he said, Women should be allowed to have access to stadiums. We're working on it. Thank you for that meaningful commitment to this issue, Mr. Flatter. Thank you so much. Anyway, he's gone, whatever. But I just want to say that this wasn't beyond the radar of FIFA at all, ever. They knew about it. They just simply didn't care. So March 2018, Johnny Infantino is at the Derby. He's physically there in the president's box watching as 30 women and girl, a young woman, as young as 13 was detained, because they were dressing up as men and boys just to attend. So he's like in the building. He doesn't comment on it when he's asked about it. He waits till he gets back to Zurich and Lausanne actually specifically where FIFA headquarters are. And then he's asked about it and then, say, then says, well, you know, I was actually meeting the president to talk about this issue. Do we believe him? No. Did he meet with any of the activists? No. Does he care? No. He only responded by saying that we're working on it, which is the same thing Seth Ladder said in 2014. So basically non-committal ineffectiveness is what we're seeing there from the very organization that is committed to and is responsible for growing the game, for advocating for the sport. Yeah, no. Um, so, June 2018, some of you might be aware that there was the World Cup. Uh, media attention pushes. There's a lot of media attention on this. So I'm salty for many reasons. I'm salty for reasons because this issue hasn't, didn't start in June 2018. Now suddenly, sports editors decided that this was a story that needed to be told. And this is a reflection of many different things. I'll rant about this a little more later, but I'm just going to let you know why I'm salty. I'm salty because I work in an industry where 90% of the decision makers and editorial boards for sports media are white, cis, hat, able-bodied men. So what does that tell you about the stories they're going to share? Is this important to them? No. Was it important to them when I pitched the story to like 15 different outlets? 
No. Vice Sports picked it up and said, we actually care about this, because I had a female editor that really gave a damn and said, this is really horrible. How come nobody knows about it? But then Vice Sports shut down their sports vertical, which really sucks. But my point is, suddenly people are paying attention. Suddenly the New York Times is paying attention. Suddenly the Guardian cares. Two specific outlets that didn't care before, because World Cup time. It's not as if this is a new issue. Now anyway, Sada, our friend from Open Stadiums, was actually flown to Moscow for the World Cup. Um, she was participating in a panel with Fair Network, which is an organization sponsored by UEFA, which is a European federation that oversees European football. Um, all of them are corrupt, but Fair actually tries to monitor misogyny, sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia in those places, so they had her go to Moscow. So the first time Sada was ever able to see her national team play, she had to fly to Russia to do it. She can go see, Iran Iranian women can go see Iranian men play, the Iranian men's team, but it can't be in their own country. Nonsensical, right? It makes no sense whatsoever. So anyway, this media attention literally forced Iran to say, okay, everyone's looking at us and thinking that we're bad. So about this issue, so we really need to do something. So what they decided to do was open up Azadi Stadium and have the match screened, Spain versus Iran screened there, and that's women attended. Now, there was a lot of excitement about this, a lot of excitement. People were like, yay, we won. FIFA was congratulating themselves. The Iranian authorities were congratulating themselves. Do they deserve that credit? So October 17th, Iran played Bolivia. So there's selected women that are allowed to enter the stadium. Now, the women allowed, and this is according from the scroll, the women allowed to enter Azadi Stadium include the national football team's family members, the national women's football team and futsal teams, the football federation's female employees, and of course, the number of female football fans. The number of football female fans that were extraneous to the previous mentioned groups was four. <coughs> four. So basically, you have the players' entourage and the national teams. Sure, I get it when people say that that's a huge win for Iranian women. No, because this amount of Iranian women comprise 60 women. The stadium can hold 68,000 people. 60 is not a win. Um, now, I know you're probably thinking, Shireen, you're really cynical. Yeah, I am. I don't believe that there'll be huge change until there's something that's effective enough to implement it systemically. This isn't change. Now, in November, this was uh, the photo from the October match. So these are some futsal team members and family members of the, the proper football team. And this was just the uh, AFC Asians League Championship, it's called. Now, this is a really interesting uh, take that I would love for you to hear, so I'm just going to read it for you. Um, 80,000 Iranian men were on their feet in respect and support of an Iranian woman when women arrived. So it was the same thing. Family members selected few that went. And Infantino, yes, the same president of FIFA, the head of the world's governing body, attended the match. And he hailed it as, quote, a historic and festive day for football, a real breakthrough, <coughs> quote, unquote. So another really great thing, in addition to men like making rules for women, they like to self-congratulate. <laughs> so they're really, really keen to point out when they do something that is worthy of praise that they didn't actually do anything for. So yay, men. <laughs> um, so... The game was not open to all women who actually wanted to attend. Now, the match itself in November was Persepolis, which you, you know of a team in Tehran, playing it out in the Asian Champions League with Japan's Kashima Antlers. So Japan likes to go to Iran. They really like, oh, I don't know, they have some like bond romance, I don't know. But they played her quite often, and they were top in their league in the Asian League, the Champions League, so they, they, they went. So now, um, the game was not open to all women who wanted to attend, and Khatibi is, a, is an activist, said that only hand-picked people whose names appeared on pre-prepared lists were allowed to enter the stadium. And a reformist newspaper called Sazan, oh sorry, Sazan Begi, 
reported that the selected included relatives of the home site as well as her foreign consult It's the same thing in October. And the women who were allowed in the seated but separate stand and entered through a different route than the men. Now, Sahar Tului is a veteran journalist and from the reformist paper, Sharh, she said she was offered the chance to attend but refused to be on that list because she found it insulting. And she says, and I quote, to put you on a list like it's a gift when it's my right and the right of women to go to stadiums and watch football matches is just unacceptable. And she's a lifelong Persepolis fan. This is what she said to the AFP in an interview. Quote, the doors of stadiums are still closed on Iranian women as a whole. They were just open on a select few for one day, end quote. So what does that tell us? That there's a lot of nuance in her analysis, that this isn't a win, this is a band-aid solution for a problem that can be easily fixed and a problem that didn't actually have to be there. So again, why is this not a win? Selective acceptance of certain fans is not, it's not okay. I talked a little bit about media ignorance. I talked about the way, and I want to get into this for another reason. My co-host Jessica Luther said something and it sticks with me a lot. The, way that a story is reported and who reports a story is as important as the story itself. We can parlay this into something Marshall McLuhan said, which was the medium is the message, right? How you're sharing the story is important. Now, the way that this story was shared previously is under the lens of, oh, well, you know, Iran, they're like totally, you know, draconian in their thinking and they oppress Muslim women. No, it's actually not that simple. It's far more complicated than that, and we're not going to have a competition saying that, oh, those country over there with brown people, they're really raised, they're really sexist. Because I'm sorry, we could just look at the hockey stadium in Edmonton that cut off bathrooms for women, so they had nowhere to pee during the playoffs. Like, we're not going to do this. We're not going to say, oh, those people over there aren't educated and treat the women like crap, because I'm sorry, y'all will fail to convince me that FIFA or any federation cares about women generally. I'm sorry, we can look at statistics of fed like funding for women all over the world in development. We can look at the US women's soccer team that had to sue their own organization and federation for equality and equity pay. So that excuse is, is, is lazy journalism. And the way that the story is reported is so bad, so bad. Like basic fact checking, like my 12 year old can Google more effectively than sometimes people, and he has. He's corrected me on a number of occasions. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, about this, so this is my beef with media, and I'm allowed to have beef with media because I'm part of media. So calling it out is essential and saying, yeah, that is really crappy. And hey, Chuck Culpepper of the Washington Post, could you really not interview somebody that knew what they were talking about? Could you really not go to a site that was absolutely shady to get your quotes? Really, was it that hard to contact open stadiums whose DMs are open and does media requests all the time? Is it really that difficult? Could you really not put, I don't know, effort into your piece? and have it balanced? No, because bottom line too, and this is reflected in media, there's no change if people don't care. There's sincerely no change. I've seen editors pass over stories, one of which, and I'm gonna slip this in because I have to, Cristiano Ronaldo's rape case. It would be staggering to you to know how many times my friend Brenda Nelson and I pitched a story after Der Spiegel came out with it, simply uninterested. And guess what's the most interesting sports story in the world right now? Well, it was a couple weeks ago. Just nobody wanted to hear because nobody cared enough to think. So who, then we look at the decision makers. Who's making the decisions on what gets reported? And that's a reflection. Is that a reflection of the actual population? No, it's a reflection of privilege. Who's in those editorial rooms? Who's making those decisions? Who are the executive producers of those shows? Why are they not bothered by this? I could go on and on. Um, furthermore, this exposes the disingenuity of federations. Federations, like I mentioned, that are specifically there to uphold and to advocate for the sport. This is directly in violation of constitutions and charters that these federations have. You cannot discriminate on someone based on their gender. You just cannot. It's sport is a birthright. Access to sport. If you don't want to play it, you at least have access to watch it. Um, false allyship. Now, this is something that goes into media a little bit and something Sarah had told me. And it's not off record, but getting back to the saviorism piece, there's people that fly in, fly in, like swoop in rather, not fly in, and try to take over a campaign. 
and say, well, we think you should do it this way. Well, no, why don't we listen to the women that are actually, I don't know, act like the ones doing the frontline activism? Why don't we kind of see what they need and they want? Because the first rule of allyship is to sit down and listen. How can you be of support? How can you help? Not you take over and dictate what's happening. That's not actually how it works. And that's not what's required. What's required is to hear what those people who need assistance, what can you do for them? And if you can't do anything, then move along. Find another cause. If you're going to be disingenuous about it, find something else to do. Um, and that also goes into the erasure of women's grassroots movements, which again ties back into who congratulates themselves when there's baby steps. Open Stadiums has been on the ground for over 15 years now. And who do you think was congratulating themselves when women were allowed into stadiums? And when I say women, like football family. It was Infantino, it was the head of the AFC. Was Open Stadiums anywhere to be found? No. Who was the one that was putting themselves in danger just to be able to have access? And the, the reason that I talk about this and why it became personal for me was 2015, the World Cup was held in Canada. So I went to Ottawa with my daughter and my niece to go watch a match. So I was live tweeting, it was super exciting. And you get to see the French national team, they're very exciting. And you get to see, I saw, we saw a double header of Mexico, Spain, France, and uh, Korea. And I remember tweeting about it, and Sarah sent me a DM, and she just said something like, I really wish I was there with you. I can't even imagine what it feels like. And you know, I'm sitting there eating $8 French fries, which are ridiculously expensive and weren't that good. And thinking, I, this, is, this is just normal for us to be able to get up and go to watch a game, to go access something, to be watching women's sport, to have the opportunity to watch men's sport. Like it was just not something that I ever thought about. So it checked me right away. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Like I've never thought of it in this way. So it was very, it became personal because I couldn't get her out of my head. And something else that she said, which was really to watch the World Cup, to watch her team play. She wrote, I, I wrote a piece about it. And she said that this is something that really, she was very measured. So I'll just read you a little bit of this because it was, you know, it was, it was relevant. Of her seeing, hang on one second, let me find it. Where is it? So I was really excited for her when she started tweeting because it was her first time watching the Iranian team play. And I thought it's going to be this overjoyous moment. It's going to be like this metaphysical crisis. She's going to have of happiness and elation. It really wasn't like that for her. In fact, it was a little bit of the opposite. So she was messaging me from the stadium. And when she sent me a video, I was able to live vicariously through her in that moment. And I remember attempting to compose an intelligent message when I saw a goal in extra time. And all I could come up with was, ah, that's literally what I texted her. And I'm sure she forgave my lack of prose, but all I could do was feel ecstatic for her. Unfortunately, her words brought me back down to reality very quickly. Honestly, I was sad in the stadium. I couldn't think about all the girls. I know that their dream is to go to the stadium. And you know I didn't even know how to cheer. I've never been to such a huge place with 60,000 people. And I was thinking, why at 35 years old, my dream is to go to stadiums. And I remember in all the things that we've been through, demonstrations, arrests, threats, disappointments, but maybe in the match I'll be better. So it wasn't this overwhelming sense of we've won. It was just an understanding and a relief, but also an awareness of how many other people still don't have access to that. Now this is important to see. So AFC President Sheikh Salman bin Ibrahim Al Khalifa, he joined FIFA president and continue welcoming the presence of more than a thousand, there wasn't a thousand there, it was absolutely not a thousand there, in Azadi Stadium for the 2018 AFC Champions League final on Saturday. That was the one in November that I mentioned. And after the final one, two, nothing on aggregate by the Antlers against Crystal Police, Sheikh Salman said, football in Asia has always been inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> and the AFC welcomes supporters no matter what their creed, beliefs, gender, or race. No. 
I thank the authorities in the Islamic Republic of Iran for making it possible for a diverse and socially representative crowd um, to witness an extraordinary occasion. Tonight was historic in so many ways and showed that the AFC continues to develop their competition. So much credit. Yeah, credit. Must go to the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Football Federation of the Islamic Republic of Iran for their cooperation and support of staging this memorable final. Oh my gosh. And then we get back to like, because men, like, who does this? So Sada did what she does best. She wrote. <laughs> and she said, in rebuttal to this, Iranian women have actually demanded open stadiums for a long time, which is part of the reason that she can't be open about her identity, because this is a chargeable offense for speaking out against anything to do with that regime is a chargeable offense. Now, again, it would be okay. It would be very possible for the AFC, and it would be very possible for FIFA to say, you know what, we really screwed up. This was bad. Do you think you're ever going to do that? It's just easier to throw those women and their movement and their campaigning and their years of toil under a bus and say, well, we've done this. But what they've done is actually just opened it up to a selective crowd of people. We don't even know if that's sustainable. And the irony of all this is in the October match that I showed you a photo of, there was a volleyball tournament at 5UB down the street. Women were not permitted to attend. So this issue goes across all sport, including wrestling, which is huge in Iran. Um, it goes across all sports. So it's just not an issue only for FIFA to take care of. But you could argue that FIFA could set the ball rolling by creating precedent, which you're still not doing. And when FIFA, their president, they can't say, well, it's not our fault, it's not our rules. Actually, if you feel that there's injustice being committed, is the right thing to do, A, go attend the derby and sit in the president's box? No. Or B, not attend at all and say, you know what, we're not sanctioning any events until women can attend which is really that simple. It's not difficult to do this, to say we're not going to support any FIFA-sponsored events in your country until you fix this. Because guess what talks more than that is money, power. FIFA has a lot of power and it has a lot of money. For them to say we're not gonna stand for this? Now, Fatima Samora, who is the Secretary General, met with Open Stadium's representatives. She flew into Tehran, so she met with some um, Sara was not one of the people she met with, but they sent Fatima Samora, who's also a Senegalese woman, so the woman of color, representing this ridiculous organization, to go and meet and says, hopefully there'll be change. So this is the first time FIFA has even acknowledged the existence of this campaign. So it's a step. Is it a big step? No. Are we going to applaud and thank FIFA and like send them thank you messages? No. Are we going to thank the Iranian Republic's Football Federation? No, we're not because it's far from over. Now, I don't want to be negative, because you're all probably like, oh my gosh, Ray, you're so cynical. Totally, I'm cynical. But let's talk about some happy things now, because I like to sort of end presentations on a happy note. I like to be half glass full. Um, the solidarity that these women have seen from players has grown incredibly in the last couple of years. So for example, um, the, just before the World Cup last year in qualifiers, Ali Karimi, who actually plays for Bayern Munich, he came up publicly on Instagram and started Instagramming about his support for women attending. And I mean, this guy doesn't have to care. His family's now allowed to come, right? His girlfriend can come. His cousins can come. Everybody related to him can come. But it was the fact that he went out against it. And the rules and rigidity in Iran for the teams when you represent the country are pretty, they're pretty uh, cemented. Didn't matter, he did it anyway. And even um, Karimi is actually, it says in here, is regarded as one of the best Iranian players of all time. So he's played in European clubs. He's one of the few Iranian players to actually play in Europe. Um, and then, who else was it? Yeah, Shojai was actually, when he went to go meet the president, Rouhani, he actually said in that meeting, the women need to access stadiums and it kind of took everybody aback and he says no women he says and he's not the current captain he's co-captain now but um masood shujai told president rohani that women need to access stadiums so these are not small steps this
This kind of stuff actually really matters. This kind of allyship, this kind of solidarity, when you have power, you have prestige, and you have access to decision makers, this matters. I mean, some people actually suggested so much as the Iranian team shouldn't attend the World Cup. They should just boycott it. I don't know how I feel about that, truthfully. Like, I don't know if I would ask somebody to necessarily do that. And then you could all say, well, wait a minute, look at Cap. He, you know, took, you do something and you take a bullet for what you love, you know, you believe in something. But at the same time, it's always putting pressure on marginalized people to make those efforts. It's the people that are literally in power that need to be pressed the most. The ones on the margins are always expected to carry and make change throughout history. And I just don't think they should have to. Um, lastly, the amplification of Iranian women has been very important here. Their voices, listening to them. Now you know about open stadiums. Now you know about the work you do. So if you see another organization calling themselves the Equality League or something else, they're not open stadiums. I'm telling you because I know. I'm not trying to detract from work they do, but I'm a firm believer in knowing what your source is, knowing what is legitimate and somebody trying to take over. There's a lot of this. I don't know why people think there's like a tremendous amount of money, because let me tell you, advocating for Muslim women in sport is not necessarily the most lucrative career. <laughs> Shocking, I know. The niche is quite small, but this idea of people getting praise and being considered praiseworthy, you're on the ground to roll your sleeves up. I don't want praise. I want these women to be recognized for the work they are doing. That's simply it. And you know, everybody, has something that they believe in. I firmly believe, maybe, yes, my own sensitivity is because of my identity, my understanding of the situation. Women should, A, have the right to choose what they want to wear. I'm a firm believer in this. Firm believer in women having access and safe access to sport. It's a tool of, it's a vehicle of good and change and betterment of society, of development for women and girls. We see it all over the world. It honestly no different. And particularly because it's a place where the women have shown to be winners and win in societies where football is huge. I don't, like, it just it makes no sense to me. Anyways, so i just like to end with a comment from Marjan Scrubley's Persepolis. It's the name of her cartoon. You can read it. Like, sometimes <laughs> the solution to problems that men create are really bad. For those that can't see it, yes. Okay, so the comic is the one of the forces saying yes, but when you run, your behind makes movements that are, how do you say obscene? Well then don't look at my ass. <laughs> so it's pretty simple. It's not that difficult. You're bothered by something, by you feel women's presence in a stadium is bothering you, don't look at her. It's this whole idea of putting the emphasis and the burden on a woman for existing. Nope. So that's my presentation, folks.